Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvise Shashanyavadi Paschachate Shatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our uh, study of Bhakti by Bhav. Um, we're beginning the third canto here this morning. Uh, this unit will cover the first four chapters in the third canto. So we'll be having, I think we have eight meetings. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll begin here. Here's some verses from Sanatana Goswami's Krishna Lila Sabha on the glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam. Since we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, it's nice to know how to glorify it. We can read it together. Everyone, you like to read together with me, please? Sarva Sastradpadi Piyusha Sarva Vaidaika Sapala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya Sarva Lokaika Driprata O Srimad Bhagavatam, O Nectar, churn from the ocean of all scriptures. You are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas, enriched with the jewels of all conclusive truth. You grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabhu, Kali Janto Dita Ditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. Paramananda Pataya Prima Varsha Aksharaya Te Sarvada Sarva Sevyaya Shri Krishnaya Namastate O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss because your syllable shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone, for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O oh my deliverer, O oh my good fortune, O oh my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Asadu saduta dayin ati nicho chatakara hana muncha kadachin mam premnarit kantayo spura. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, please don't ever leave me accompanied by pure love of Krishna. Please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Hare Krishna, is everybody able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. 
All right, we're going to, I just want to make a quick review over the first two cantos before we go into the third canto. Very quickly, we'll just go through. So we d divided the first canto into three parts. All right, 19 chapters in the first canto. And it began with the sages in Naimisharanya, we heard about Sutta Goswami being questioned by the sages, Sonakarishi. They were describing, they had six questions in the first chapter there, and Sonaka was describing the qualifications of the speaker, like that. So the first three chapters, pretty much Sutta to the sages. We heard Sutta Goswami reply to the questions of the sages in the second chapter. And the third chapter was Krishna's avatars. That was also part of their questions. They wanted to hear about Krishna's incarnations. And so they went into chapter four, five, six, we heard about Narada Muni and Vyasadeva, how the Bhagavatam came to be written how Srila Vyasadeva was despondent after writing so many books and Narada glorified him, Narada chastised him and told him he'd not properly glorified devotional service. And then first canto then goes into the, the disappearance of different personalities. We hear about Ashwatthama and his firing the Brahmasa weapon and Lord Krishna protecting Parikshit in the womb. And then we hear about the disappearance of, first of all, Grandfather Bhishma. And then there's also the Pandavas, the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. Then the Pandavas retire and after Lord Krishna also leaves the world. Pandavas so retire to Himalayas. So you have the disappearance of all these different personalities. And then, with Parikshit in charge, he gets cursed, and then you have the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami, who's the speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? So those are the four main sections of the first canto. Right? A little note here about the preface. The preface to Srimad Bhagavatam, although just two pages, is a very condensed document. You can study it in great detail with great profit and utility. Since the Srimad Bhagavatam was Srila Prabhupada's life work, its preface is also a preface to his life and institutions such as ISKCON. So, I hope you're all familiar with the preface. It's certainly very nice to read it again and again. The introduction to the Srimad Bhagavatam, primarily 35-page biography on the life of Lord Chaitanya, the ideal preacher of Srimad Bhagavatam. Without his mercy, very difficult to understand the Bhagavatam. Canto 1 is a preface to the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. In a preface, we find, first of all, the purpose of the book, the qualifications of the speaker, the qualification of the listener, and circumstances under which the book was produced. So this is all described in the first canto. Some basic points about the Bhagavatam, I think you're all, you don't need to go over them. We'll go ahead. Canto 1. Chapter 1 to 3, questions by the sages, Sutta Goswami. Chapter 4 to 6, Vyasadeva Narada Muni. Yes. Then 7 to 15, disappearance of Krishna and his associates and the appearance of Srimad Bhagavatam and his associates. Krishna's mission of incarnation was finished with the battle of Kurukshetra. So he enjoyed pastimes for several years 
and then he and his associates disappeared. The disappearance of the Pandavas, disappearance of Dhritarashtra, Bhishma Dev, Kunti Devi, and finally the appearance of Maharaj Pariksit, all in the first canto. All right, so immediately after the Kurukshetra battle, you had, uh, that was uh, Queen Kunti's prayers and Ashwatthama throwing the Brahmastra weapon. And then later you have the birth of Pariksit and Lord Krishna's travel to Dwarka. And then 13, 14, 15, these chapters later, we're hearing about the disappearance, different personalities, particularly the, the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, disappearance of Lord Krishna. Like so 16 to 19, the meeting of Maharaj Pariksit, the personality of Kali, and Sukadeva Goswami. It sets the scene for the birth of Srimad Bhagavatam. All right. So that's the breakdown of the first canto in summary. In the second canto, you got ten chapters and three sections. You've got three different situations. You've got, first of all, Sukadeva Goswami. He had, he'd appeared just at the end of the first canto. So he's replying to Parikshit Maharaj's questions. And then it goes into Lord Brahma and how Lord Brahma was questioned by Narada and how Lord Brahma re replied to Narada Muni. And then you have Lord Vishnu instructing Brahma. So different speakers of Srimad Bhagavatam. You have Sukadev speaking, you have Brahma speaking, you have Lord Vishnu himself speaking. Okay, in the second canto, Sukadeva Goswami starts his instruction to Maharaj Parikshit. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. The first three chapters describing different levels of realization of the Absolute Truth. First, first chapter, you have the first step in God realization, your pantheism. And then second chapter, the Lord in the heart, which is mysticism. And then the third chapter, we hear more about the process of devotional service and approaching the Supreme Lord. That's the first three chapters of the second canto. Okay. The complete science of God. The second, Maharaj Pariksit was very satisfied, but he wanted to hear more, especially how God creates, maintains, and annihilates the material world. Sukadeva Goswami agrees, and after offering preliminary prayers in chapter 4, in chapter 5 through 7, he explains how Brahma first spoke Srimad Bhagavatam to Narada Muni. So this is second canto describing what happened there. Maharaj Parikshit was satisfied. He heard from Sukadeva Goswami, but he wanted to hear more. He wanted to hear particularly about how the Lord creates, maintains and annihilates. So that was described. Sukadeva Goswami went on to speak about how Brahma replied to Narada Muni when Narada Muni had inquired similarly about these things. Okay. Then after hearing the Bhagavatam that Brahma spoke to Narada, Maharaj Parikshit is even more enlivened. So he asks to hear even more. Sukadeva Goswami then explains the original Srimad Bhagavatam as Vishnu spoke it to Lord Brahma. That comes at the end of the second canto, right? The canto ends with the sages asking about the meeting of Vidura and Maitreya. So that last section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapters 8, 9, 10, you have uh, Sukadeva Goswami, well, it's Lord Vishnu actually, Lord Vishnu is speaking to Brahma, but being described by Sukadeva Goswami. 
and you, you get the Chatur Sloki, first of all, the Chatur Sloki is spoken, and then after the Chatur Sloki, then the ten topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam are, are given in the tenth chapter. You have the ten topics which are going to be all described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Ten topics all come out from the four nutshell verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam, from the four verses of the Chatur Sloki. So the ten topics are mentioned there in the tenth chapter. And then after discussion about the, the topics of the tenth canto, then at the end of the chapter, uh, Sona Karishi said he wants to hear about the meeting between Vidura and Maitreya. And Srila Prabhupada comments that, he said, the sages there maybe had become tired of hearing about the creative potency. They wanted to hear something more transcendental. And so they inquired about the meeting between Vidura and Maitreya. Right? So there's the three sections of the second canto. Right? And at the end of the tenth canto, they're asking, we want to hear about what happened when Vidura met with Maitreya. Something to notice, the Srimad Bhagavatam is presented five times in the first two cantos. The final section of the second canto, you have Vishnu speaking to Brahma. That's where the Chatur Sloki is and the ten topics. And then you had also Brahma speaking to Narada. He was also presenting Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, chapters 5 to 7. And then the first canto, you have Narada speaking to Vyas. And then you have Vyas speak, speaking to Sukadeva Goswami, right? But when Vyas spoke to Sukadeva Goswami, the <laughs> Sukadeva Goswami was in the womb, so it didn't actually happen. Sukadeva Goswami came out of the womb, he immediately left home. So he never heard Srimad Bhagavatam from Vyasadeva. So that's one point to note. Sukadeva Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit, that's there. Maharaj Parikshit was there and Sutta Goswami was in the audience. He was also hearing, although he was not being directly spoken to, he was hearing the conversation. And then you have also Sutta speaking to the sages of Naimasharanya. So you see five different group, five different presentations of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the Padapadma in these first two cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam. But Vyas never spoke it to Sukadeva Goswami. The great transcendentalists thus describe the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the pure devotees deserve to see more glorious things in transcendence beyond these features. Certainly, just hearing about creation, it's all right, but we want to hear something more. So, at the end of the second canto, this is chapter 10, texts 49 and 50, the, you have Sonika Rishi asking, uh, asking Sutta Goswami four questions. Sonika Rishi asked Sutta Goswami to describe what was the reason for Vidura's giving up the connection with his family members? 
Vidura was only discussed, well, he was introduced there in the first canto in the 13th chapter. We were told about how he came back suddenly. He came back to the palace to deliver Dhritarashtra. So it was, uh, it was not explained, the, all the circumstances, that why he'd gone away from the family. And for many, many years he had not come home. So when he came home, it was a big event and everybody came to greet him. So Sonakarishi and the sages in Naimisharanya, they want Sutta Goswami to explain to them what was the reason for Vidura giving up the connection with his family members? He was staying in that house in Hastinapur, in the palace there, and Lord Krishna would come there also. He said that, that place was very dear to Lord Krishna, that he liked to come there. So why did Vidura leave it? And, what, and it, once he left it, why did he again come home? He'd left it for something like 30 to 35 years, he'd gone away, but then he came back. Usually, you know, you go away from home, you don't want to come back, <laughs> right? Sometimes, you, sometimes that happens, sometimes people, uh, you know, they, they give up the material world but after some time they become, oh, I think I want to go home. <laughs> we see this phenomena in ISKCON also it happens. People give up the family members, but then after some time somehow the family, of course, they try their best to influence a person to come home. And sometimes, sometimes people go home again. So why did Vidura come home? He was already enlightened, greatly enlightened. He didn't need to come home. Why did he do it? And what were the activities of Vidura while he was at the places of pilgrimage? So then Canto 3 begins with, what topics were discussed between Vidura and Maitreya? So this is the connection between the second and the third canto. And this, this will be the topic of the third and the fourth canto. We'll hear about Vidura and Maitreya and all these different things, what happened, what did Vidura learn and why he came home and why he's coming back to give the family connection. All right, so the third chapter, the first, the first chapter begins like this, with uh, questions by Vidura. Vidura recommended Pandava's share be returned and Duryodhana expelled. These are, these are the main points coming from the first section of the first chapter of the third canto. Let's go back to the text, we'll open the text and we'll see uh, Okay, so here we have the text. The chapter begins, Sukadeva Goswami is speaking and describing about Vidura. After renouncing his prosperous home and, re and entering the forest, King Vidura, the great devotee, asked this question of his grace, Maitreya Rishi. <laughs> it's interesting, they put King Vidura, and Prabhupada put King Vidura, of course, Vidura was never actually a king, but he is certainly a great devotee. And he's described mm, mm, he is described as his grace, mm, his, the great sage Maitreya, 
and then Maitreya Bhagavan Kila Shatra Vanam Pravishtena Chyakva Swagriham Ridimat. So Prabhupada, for some reason, put here King Vidura, the great devotee. asked this question of His Grace Maitreya. What else is there to say about the residential house of the Pandavas? Sri Krishna, the Lord of everything, acted as your minister. He used to enter that house as if it were his own, and he did not take any care of Duryodhana's house. So Lord Krishna, of course, is always partial to his devotees. Certainly he would go to the home of the Pandavas, and he would not be eager to go to the home of Duryodhana. And Prabhupada quotes here in the purport, the how, uh, everything that uh, Lord Ananda Chinma, uh, Ananda Rasap. In the Brahma Samhita, Lord Krishna describes, uh, Lord Brahma describes how everything connected with Lord Krishna is not different from Lord Krishna. Achintya Bed Abeda Tattva. So the Vrindavan. Dham is not different from Lord Krishna, and similarly this palace of the Pandavas is also intimately connected with Lord Krishna, because it's the home of his dear devotees. And Lord Krishna would go there, as stated here, he used to enter that house as if it were his own. So. Lord Krishna had so much love for his devotees, the Pandavas, that he could go to their home and he could identify that home, just like his own home. Prabhupada said, it is mentioned here that the Lord identified the house with his own self. Thus the house of the Pandavas was as good as Vrindavan, and Vidura should not have given up that place of transcendental bliss. Ananda Chinmaya Rasa Pratibhavitabhis, right? And Brahma Samhita, Ananda Chinmaya Rasa Pratibhavitabhis, that everything connected with Lord Krishna is the internal potency of the Lord. Prabhupada told us about things like the incense, making incense for the deity. This is the Lord's paraphernalia. And the Mridanga drum, the kartals, Prabhupada was so concerned, don't put them on the floor. You know, our tendency, we, the drum, we put, put the drum down, just place it on the floor. Prabhupada would get very upset if he saw the Mridanga sitting on the floor. So this is Krishna's paraphernalia, you don't put it on the floor. It's so like that, understanding everything in relation to Krishna to be of a spiritual nature, then we'll take proper care of it. So in the same way, the, the home of the Pandavas was also a very spiritual, very special place, so much so that Lord Krishna would go and live there and, and he would think of it like his own place. All right, so verse number three, the king asked Sukadeva Goswami, the king here being Parikshit Maharaj, so he is the king, where and when did the meeting and discussion take place between Saint Vidura and His Grace Maitreya Muni? Kindly oblige, my Lord, and describe this to us. Hmm. 
I think that it must be a misprint in that first text where they put King Vidura. <laughs> it should have been Saint Vidura. All right. Purport. Exactly as Shona Karishi inquired of Sutta Goswami, and Sutta Goswami replied, so Srila Sukadeva Goswami replied to King Pariksha's inquiries. The king was very anxious to understand the meaning, the meaningful discussion that took place between the two great souls. So Maharaj Pariksha is eager to hear. In the same way, Sutta Goswami, the sages headed by Shonakarishi, they're also eager to hear. They want to know what happened when these two great personalities met. Saint Vidura and His Grace Maitreya Muni. Certainly must have been very significant, the topics which they discussed. Going ahead, text number four. Saint Vidura was a great and pure devotee of the Lord, and therefore his questions to His Grace Rishi Maitreya must have been very purposeful on the highest level and approved by learned circles. Certainly two great souls meeting. Saint Vidura was already a great and pure devotee of the Lord. And Maitreya Rishi, of course, he was really very fortunate, very special, that he could be there at the time when Lord Krishna, just before he departed from the world, and he could hear the instructions which the Lord gave to Uddhava. So Maitreya has also very, he, he's received a lot of mercy from Lord Krishna. And so here we have these two great souls meeting. So their, their discussion must have been on the highest level when they, two such great personalities meet. Their questions and answers must be very, very meaningful. Prabhupada would be cautious about asking for questions. In the beginning of our movement, Prabhupada was taking questions. But after some time, he became disappointed with the standard of the questions. And he would just simply lecture. And he'd say, if any question, then you ask my disciples, they can answer you. Uh, Prabhupada often found the questions to be challenging. Now in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, text number 34, we see Prabhupada's purport there is talking about how we should inquire, because that verse speaks about inquiring. Tadvidi pranipadena pari prashnena sevaya. Pari prashnena means inquiries, all round inquiries. Try to under, one who wants to understand the, the the truth, just just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual teacher and inquire from him. So Prabhupada talks about the nature of these inquiries, and he said they should not be challenging questions, and they shouldn't be foolish questions also. So Prabhupada often found in his public lectures that there was a tendency for this to be there. The questions were either challenging or foolish. And so Prabhupada, at one, after some point, he stopped taking questions. He would just lecture. But here, you have Vidura and Maitreya. And it, it's something like Ramananda Rai meeting Lord Chaitanya. You know, we see these kind of encounters from time to time in our scriptures. It's often there, actually. Our scriptures are full of the encounters between great souls and endeavouring transcendentalists and how they inquire and how they get very deep, meaningful answers to their inquiries.
So question and answers. Prabhupada talks about different classes of people, ordinary men, business people and so on, karmis, they will not talk of anything very interesting. Their topics will always be this gramyakata. There will be no transcendental sound vibrations coming from their mouth. Their words will be more like the croaking of the frogs. But when devotees meet, it's of a very different nature. Because the devotees come together to glorify Lord Krishna and to discuss topics of Krishna. Of course, that's also described in the Bhagavad Gita in the, in, in the tenth chapter, text number nine. Machita madgata prana bodayantas parasparam katayantas chamam nityam tushyanti cha ramanti cha. Right? The, the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So this is the business of devotees. When we come together, we want to discuss topics of Krishna. And this is what happens when Vidura meets Maitreya, certainly. They discuss things on the highest level. So, the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, As a student, Maharaj Parikshit was serious about learning the science of God. And Sukadeva Goswami was a bona fide spiritual master in the transcendental science. Both of them knew that the topics discussed by Vidura and Rishi Maitreya were elevated, and thus Maharaj Parikshit was very interested in learning from the bona fide spiritual master. So there were very elevated topics, very, and, and, and Prabhupada said, he describes Maharaj Parikshit as, as a student. Actually, Maharaj Parikshit, of course, he, he's also pure devotee. He'd been a great devotee throughout his life. Remember, he's Vishnu Rata. He was saved at the time of when he was, when he was a child in the womb. He was saved by the Lord from the, Ashwatam, from the weapon of Ashwatthama. So he's Vishnu Rata and he's Parikshit, he's examiner. He's always thinking, where is Krishna? When will Krishna come? But he's also a student and he's come before Sukadeva Goswami to hear topics of Krishna. So this whole Srimad Bhagavatam is based on questions and answers. Questions and answers on the highest level. Not like in the marketplace, not like in the shopping bazaar, but on the highest level between great sages and very elevated souls. Going ahead, text number five, Sutta Goswami speaking. The great sages Sukadev Goswami was highly experienced and was pleased with the king. Thus being questioned by the king, he said to him, please hear the topic attentively. So you can see back and forth that we've got Sukadeva Goswami. Sutta Goswami is describing about Sukadeva Goswami meeting Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami and he's going to describe to Maharaj Parikshit about Vidura meeting Maitreya. So text 6 comes to Sukadeva Goswami and he begins by talking about Dhritarashtra. King Dhritarashtra became blind under the influence of impious desires to nourish his dishonest sons. And thus he set fire to the lacquer house to burn his fatherless nephews, the Pandavas. Sukadeva Goswami begins speaking about the atrocities of Dhritarashtra. 
how the, he encouraged this kind of impious activities, trying to bring death, trying to do some great harm to the Pandavas, if possible to kill them, get rid of them from the world. Of course, Dhritarashtra is their uncle, but he has no affection for the Pandavas. His affection is solely based towards his 100 sons, headed by Dhritarashtra. Headed by, rather, Duryodhan, Duryodhan, the oldest son. So Dhritarashtra, blind from birth, blind materially and blind also spiritually. So to be blind materially is not so bad as to be blind spiritually. A person may be blind, but they can still cultivate Krishna consciousness. We do have a number of devotees who are blind, but they can be very nice devotees. They're very Krishna conscious. Uh, Srila Prabhupada even told the story about the blind man who wanted to go to the temple. And the, the son of the blind man was surprised that, why, why do you want to go to the temple? You can't see anything. But the blind man told his son, he said, I can't see, but I want God to see me. So that, that's a nice thinking, that we should go to the temple, not just to see, but to be seen. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada often spoke about this, that the position, our position is to be seen, not to, be, not to see, but to be seen. We're all blind in some ways, and we need, we, but we need to be seen. We want to be seen by Lord Krishna. We want Lord Krishna to see us. So we go to the temple, not just to look at God, but we want God to see us, that we've come there to see Him, and that we offer our prayers and respects to Him. So Dorita, uh, Sukadeva Goswami speaks about how Dhritarashtra tried to burn the Pandavas, have them burned to death. And in this way he, he failed at that attempt. And then Sukadeva Goswami continues describing other activities which happened in the palace of the Kuravas. Other offences which Dhritarashtra committed. Text number 7 describes, The king did not forbid his son, Dusha's son's abominable action of grabbing the hair of Draupadi, the wife of the godly king Yudhisthira, even though her tears washed the red dust on her breast. So this was also a great atrocity and a great offence against a great devotee. Mother Draupadi, of course, is a very great devotee and she's the wife of Maharaj Yudhisthira, she's the wife of the Pandavas. And Dhritarashtra was duty bound to give some protection to the women in his palace, but he allowed his son, Dusha son, to t grab her by the hair. So very offensive. And this is, of course, this led to the battle of Kurukshetra and the destruction of all the Kauravas. And Dhritarashtra is also involved because he was the king. He, was, he should not have allowed it, but he did not say anything. Text number 8. Yudhisthira, who was born without any enemy, was unfairly defeated in gambling. But because he had taken the vow of truthfulness, he went off to the forest. When he came back in due course and begged the return of his rightful share of the kingdom, he was refused by Dhritarashtra, who was overwhelmed by illusion. So the Pandavas were forced into gambling, dice, a dice match. And it was crooked. The whole event was rigged. The dice were not proper. They were 
the dice were such that the you know that the, the Pandavas could never win. So they lost everything. They lost all their kingdom, they lost their wealth, they lost even Draupadi, and then they were also forced into exile for so many years. So after, and Yudhisthira accepted all of this because Yudhisthira is son of Dharmaraj, so he's very truthful, he never tells a lie, and he accepted that all right, we have to go and live in the forest for 14 years and, and then come back. And when he came back, he was expecting to get back some kingdom. Actually, Yudhisthira was meant to be the king because his father had been the ruler. Dhritarashtra being blind, he could not be the king. Dhritarashtra was the oldest son, but he was blind, so he could not be the king. So he always resented that his sons were not given the full right. Anyway, the kingdom went to Dhritarashtra's younger brother, Pandu, and Pandu became king. When Pandu died, at that time the Pandavas were still young children, so they could not be king. So the kingdom came back to Dhritarashtra. But by now, by this time, the, by the time the gambling match took place, the Pandavas had grown up and they had their, the right to become the king. But then the gambling match took place and then they had to go off to the forest and live in the forest so, so many years. So when they come back, they expect to get the kingdom back. But they're told, no, there's no kingdom for you. And that's a big problem. As we see in the purport, text number eight, the last sentence, a Brahmana, Kshatriya or Vaishya will not accept employment for his livelihood under any circumstances. So this is the Vedic culture. We see today, of course, Brahmanas, they're all, they're, they're Jati Brahmins, they're Brahmanas in the name only. But if we go into one of the multinational corporations, we'll find so many Brahmanas working there. And they'll say, I'm a Brahmana, I'm a Brahmana. But they're working, they're doing Sudra work. Working for someone else is Sudra. But a Brahman, Kshatriya or Vaishya is in the proper sense, they will never work for someone. They, they must maintain themselves by their own efforts. They cannot just simply be engaged in the service of someone under any circumstance. And this, this is not only for Brahmanas, it's for Kshatriyas and also Vaishyas. So the Pandavas being Kshatriyas, they're not expected to take up any other kind of service. So they want their kingdom. But Duryodhan, he said he's not even willing to give enough land to go through the eye of a needle. So in other words, get nothing. So this, of course, the result of this is the battle of Kurukshetra. And Prabhupada notes at the, in the purport there, he said, the battle of Kurukshetra, therefore, was induced by the Kurus and not the Pandavas. Pandavas wanted to avoid the battle if possible. And Maharaj Yudhisthira even sent Lord Krishna there to try to resolve the issue and get some uh, justice, but nothing doing. The Kauravas were determined there must be war. And so it happened, the war took place. Going ahead, text number nine. Lord Krishna was sent by Arjuna into the assembly as the spiritual master of the whole world. And although his words were heard by some, like Bhishma, as pure nectar, it was not so for the others who were completely bereft of the last farthing of past pious works. The king Dhritarashtra or Duryodhana did not take the words of Lord Krishna very seriously. So as I just described there, Lord Krishna went there as a messenger to try to make peace, but it was not possible. 
Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan were not willing to have peace. They wanted the war. They said, there's no possibility. We cannot coexist. There has to be war. So the war had to take place. Uh, at the end of the purport, Prabhupada mentions, the message of Godhead is always like nectar to the devotees, but it is just the opposite to the non-devotees. Sugar candy is always sweet to a healthy man, but it tastes very bitter to persons suffering from jaundice. So we see Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan, they're the people with the jaundice. They have jaundice of material life and therefore they cannot taste the nectar of Lord Krishna's words. Although Lord Krishna was so merciful to them that he came there and spoke to them, but they were so they were so covered, they were so contaminated, they were so much in disease condition, in the jaundice condition, they could not accept the words of Lord Krishna. So even Lord Krishna may be present before us. It doesn't mean everyone will just surrender, become a devotee. It doesn't happen. Going ahead, text 10. When Vidura was invited by his elder brother Dhritarashtra, for consultation, he entered the house and gave instructions, which were exactly to the point. His advice is well known, and instructions by Vidura are approved by expert ministers of state. So Vidura was living there. This is before he has gone off, before he went off on pilgrimage, of course. He was actually like a Prime Minister to King Dhritarashtra. And King Dhritarashtra would often ask him for his opinion. Well, what do you think of the, what should we do in this situation? Because Dhritarashtra is a king and Dhritarashtra is blind. So he very much depended on Vidura. And Vidura is, they're actually brothers, remember. They're both born of the semen of Vyasadeva, but in the wombs of different women. So Vidura was consulted by Dhritarashtra and this is an important point. This is actually coming up to the, the exile of Vidura. Vidura is going to leave home after this. But Dhritarashtra wanted to know what did Vidura think. He, he values Vidura's judgment. So Vidura is described here, text number 11. What does he think? <laughs> and Vidura's opinion is very strong and is very much against the, uh, the son of Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan. We will see. And Vidura is very upset with the way in which they have dealt with the Pandavas. Vidura always had affection for the Pandavas and he tells Dhritarashtra, text number 11, you must now return the legitimate share to Yudhisthira, who has no enemies and who has been forbearing through untold sufferings due to your offences. He is waiting with his younger brothers, among whom is a revengeful beam, breathing heavily like a snake. Surely you are afraid of him. I don't know if they're, are they really afraid of him? Vidura seems to think they must be afraid of Bhima. Certainly Duryodhan is not afraid of him. Duryodhan will fight with him at the end of the Kurukshetra war. So Vidura is telling Dhritarashtra, You've not been fair to the Pandavas, you, you didn't deal with them properly, you committed many offences, you should give back their property. Vidura continues, Lord Krishna, the Personality of Godhead, has accepted the sons of Prita as his kinsmen 
and all the kings of the world are with Lord Sri Krishna. He is present in his home with all his family members, the kings and princes of the Yadu dynasty, who have conquered an unlimited number of rulers, and he is their Lord. Vidura shows his great devotion for Lord Krishna, and he glorifies the position of Lord Krishna, and he points out to the Kauravas, headed by Dhritarashtra, that, look, these Pandavas, that they're the friends of Lord Krishna, that he's with them, he's always with them. And Lord Krishna, with the Yadu dynasty, they have conquered an unlimited number of rulers. They have conquered all the other kings of the world. So you should, you, the, Lord Krishna and his army, they're on the side of the Pandavas. You better give them their land. If you don't give them, you don't satisfy them, you're going to be in trouble. And Prabhupada comments in the purport about how, of course, Lord Krishna, as a young child, he had killed Kamsa and Putana. Well, he's still a young man. He, didn't, he, he showed his strength. He showed he's very powerful. You should remember that Lord Krishna is on the side of these Pandavas. They're very friendly, very intimate with each other. So you should be careful how you deal with the Pandavas. Then text 13. Vidura is giving an, an instruction which is really not going to be appreciated by Dhritarashtra <laughs> or by Duryodhana. Vidura tells Dhritarashtra, he said, you are maintaining offence personified, Duryodhana, as your infallible son, but he is envious of Lord Krishna. And because you are thus maintaining a non-devotee of Krishna, you are devoid of all auspicious qualities. Relieve yourself of this ill fortune as soon as possible and do good to the whole family. So Vidura is telling Dhritarashtra, you know, you should get rid of this Duryodhana, get him out of the house. In, in Mahabharata, it describes about uh, the birth. Gandhari is giving birth to her children, the 100 children. And when the first child was born, the first child, of course, Duryodhana, there were many bad omens, many very bad omens. And they were very worried. And they called Vidura. What, what do these omens mean? And Vidura told them at that time, right at the very birth of Duryodhana, he told them, he said, oh, he said, this is very inauspicious. This child is going to create havoc. It's going to ruin the whole world. You should get rid of this child immediately. Don't keep this child. So this was Duryodhana, right from his very birth. Vidura had told this to Dhritarashtra. Of course, Dhritarashtra couldn't do it. He couldn't do it because he had no son. This was his eldest son, the first son. He cannot give it up, cannot give up the child. So here again, at this particular point, the Pandavas have come back after exile and they want back some land, some kingdom, and they're asking Vidura what should be done. And Vidura is telling them, you have to get rid of Duryodhana. He's the person who's creating all the trouble. Text 14. While speaking thus, Vidura, whose personal character was esteemed by respectable persons, was insulted by Duryodhana, who was swollen with anger and whose lips were trembling. Duryodhana was in company with Karna, his younger brothers and his maternal uncle Sukuni, Sakuni. So these people, just see the company Duryodhana keeps. He's with Karna and Shakuni. And Prabhupada mentions here about the bad association. 
He said, Duryodhan was so foolish, he dared to insult Vidura. This was due to his bad association with Shakuni, his maternal uncle, as well as with his friend Karna, who, was always, who always encouraged Duryodhan in his nefarious acts. So, <laughs> this is the nature of palace life. There's always these kind of conflicts and a lot of intrigue going on. Different people want power, who should be in power. So Vidura, he's not given any respect and Duryodhana is... Well, first of all, Vidura told Dhritarashtra, you should get your son out of here, throw him out of the palace. But Duryodhana comes and he says, we should get Vidura out of here, throw him out of the palace. And this comes up, text 15, Duryodhana is speaking here, who asked him to come here, this son of a cat mistress? He is so crooked that he spies in the interests of the enemy against those on whose support he has grown up. Toss him out of the palace immediately. Leave him with only his breath. This is Duryodhan, and this is how he wants to deal with Vidura. Vidura is a saintly person, and he's the intimate, uh, he's a, the brother of his father, but Duryodhana, listen how he abuses him, he criticizes his birth, he's the son of a kept mistress, and then he criticizes his character. He said he's so crooked that he spies in the interests of the enemy. So you can see the demonic mentality, you know, we're encouraged to see everybody equally, but Duryodhana is talking about who is the enemy. And who are the enemies? Of course, he's talking about the Pandavas. So Duryodhan doesn't like the fact that Vidura is so partial to the Pandavas. And he wants him to be beaten and tossed out. So text 16 describes how Vidura responds. Thus being pierced by arrows through his ears, and afflicted to the core of his heart, Vidura placed his bow on the door and quit his brother's palace. He was not sorry, for he considered the acts of the external energy to be supreme. This is a very nice way to view these kind of reverses which come in life. Of course, we all have reverses in life. And we have to learn from scriptures how to deal with these reverses. Here we see, in this case, how, uh, how Vidura dealt with what happened in his palace. He'd been working in the palace. He was like the prime minister, giving a lot of help and advice there. And he was being criticized, very strongly, very badly criticized. And there was even... Uh, a tendency, Duryodhan wants Vidura to be beaten, to be caned and thrown out. So Vidura thinks, well, why should I wait for that to happen? Let me get out of the house now. So he immediately decides to leave the, the palace and he understands it to be the acts of the Supreme, the external energy of the Supreme. There are two aspects actually here. There's external energy and there's also the internal energy. We want to understand this properly. Yeah, it's mentioned here in the purport, when you read through the purport, the effects of the material, the, 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 the effect of the reversals which take place, it can be seen as an act of the external energy but it can also be seen as an act of the internal energy, that we can take it for our own benefit. And Vidura did like that. It's mentioned at the, in the purport here, at the end of the purport here, 
Thus he left the palace before Duryodhan could act. Maya, the supreme energy of the Lord, acted here both internally and externally. So internally, internally it was acting. Maya was acting in the sense that it was an opportunity for Vidura to come closer to Krishna, to, to approach the Lord. He left the palace and he could go off and visit the holy places. He could go and travel in the holy places and meet the great sages who reside there and get spiritual enlightenment. He could go and bathe in the holy rivers and he could see the deities in the different temples. So this was all the act of the internal energy. And the external energy is acting also in the sense that he is going out of the palace. He's giving up a comfortable material situation. He's giving up a position and respect which was there. He had some respect, but he, he sees the, the attack, the criticism of Duryodhana, that this is the, the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. Krishna arranges these different situations for us, and we can take it for our spiritual advantage, and we can take it for our material, uh, we could say, our material difficult, put us in some material difficulties. We want to understand this, how in many cases, many great Acharyas, uh, they're all affected by this kind of situations. We see the effect of the Supreme acting on many great devotees. Prabhupada himself described how Krishna took away his business, right? There's that famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna says, when I am very merciful to someone, I take everything away from them. Now then, in that helpless condition, then they surrender unto me. So Prabhupada saw that in his own life. Srila Prabhupada saw how Krishna took away his business, took away his his money, and took away his money, then his family members no longer respected him. When you don't have any money, then no one will respect you, right? The family members didn't respect him anymore, and even his wife was not nice, and his books disappeared. So there were many different things happened at home, and Prabhupada understood it was time to leave home. There was a very nice devotee, member of ISKCON, maybe you met him, I don't know. His name was Mahavishnu Goswami. He was an elderly Gujarati gentleman who came to Krishna consciousness. In quite old age, he came to Krishna consciousness. So he became a sannyasi and spiritual master also. And so he said about his own family life, because he'd been in family life, he had family, children and so on, he said, it's better to leave home before they tell you to go. He said, if you, wait, you wait at home, one day they will tell you, that one day they will say to you, why don't you go? So you don't want that to happen. It's better you go before they tell you to go. So Vidura did like that. Vidura got out before they told him to go. You know, probably they were going to beat him and throw him out anyway. So he thought, let me go, <laughs> just get out, go. And it was a blessing for Vidura. It was a great blessing. It was not a problem. Although it seemed like a problem, externally, the, the external energy, it appears difficult. But by the grace of the internal potency, it's a blessing. It's a chance to make spiritual advancement, to purify our consciousness and to come closer to Krishna. So we can see the example here of the external energy acting. And 
we see it in the lives of many great devotees, how Krishna arranges these kind of difficulties. Maybe those of you who are listening, you can think of some examples. Did you ever, did you ever have any examples in your own life like this? where you saw the external energy and the internal energy acting together at the same time? I know in my own life it certainly happened. It certainly happened. I was working in a job. I had a job, I was working, I would graduated from university, I was working for a while. And then something happened, there was, there was an arrangement that the, the company I was working in, there was to be a big change. And what had, I'd already started visiting the temple in London at the time. And I was really, really enjoying going to the temple. I really liked it. And the devotee there in the temple was telling me, you should give up your job. Actually, I was staying in the temple and going to work. And, and the devotee was telling me, he said, you should give up your job and just become full-time devotee. And so, you know, I just started the job. I only a few months I'd been I'd just come out of college and not even one year I was working and the the devotee was telling me, Give up your job, just become full time devotee and I was I was not sure if I could do it or not. But then it happened, there was a change in the company, a big change and it you know, and I thought, well, I thought this is the opportunity. I thought this is the chance I've been waiting for. I think Krishna has arranged this for me just so that I can resign, give up the job and become full-time devotee. And that's what happened. And I'm still a devotee <laughs> somehow. I'm still a devotee. It's more than 50 years now. So I think that was definitely Krishna's arrangement. So I saw it in my own life. I don't know, any of you have experience like this? Or you can think of some example from the scriptures where you see the supreme energy of Krishna acting both internally and externally. Yes, anybody has any answers? One of them is picked up here. Yeah, Prabhu, go ahead. Can anybody hear you, Prabhu? No? Yeah, can, can, okay. So, once again, we lost you. Gone again, I think this is like external internal. We don't have connection. Yeah, yeah okay. Harminder Prabhu wanted to say. Right, Harminder. I would have sustained there for one 
one more week, I would have been behind the bars in a drug case without any proper cause. It was just the lucky of God, some kind of disrespect for uh, the, uh, the, all the mental trouble, but Krishna saved me in a big way. So I, and then actually, as soon as I left the company, that was Nirjal Aikadashi, they just threw me out. So next day, I went to Sri Lanka for the mental peace. So I liked it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yes, external. Very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes. So the, there are many examples. We can see these different situations come. And you have to see the positive side of it. Don't just see the negative side that, oh, I'm losing, I'm losing, I'm losing, oh, no, no, I won't have a job, or I'm out of the home, oh, or my, my, my girlfriend has left me, or something like this. <laughs> you know? uh, we, we should think this is a blessing from Krishna. Mm. And we have to see the positive side of everything in life, that it's an opportunity to come to Krishna. So Maya acts both internally and externally. Externally can take away the material things, things which we think are important to us in the material world. And internally, it's an opportunity for us to come closer to Krishna, to purify ourselves, and to save us from a lot of entanglement in material life. So Vidura saw this very nicely. Uh, so Vid Vidura hadn't been mentioned very much in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it only just Briefly, it was there in the 13th chapter with Dhritarashtra. Now we're hearing about Vidura. One question which comes up is, was Vidura actually, you know, should he, should he actually have been giving instruction to Dhritarashtra? Dhritarashtra is the king. And remember, Vidura, by caste, he's, you know, he's like a sudra. You know, but here he comes and he's giving instruction, telling Dhritarashtra what should he do. You know, you should throw your son out of here and so on. So was this proper of Vidura to do like this? Do you think Vidura was, was he in the wrong to come forward and be giving instruction to Dhritarashtra? Anybody like to comment on this? Maharaj, uh, Dhritarashtra always consulted Vidura because he was, uh, uh, Vidura was uh, extremely wise and he was giving the right uh, kind of instruction. So, in that uh, case, uh, Vidura was not wrong in uh, providing whatever consultation was needed. Yeah, but Vidura is a sudra, right? He's low birth. So, and then. Usually, you know, we won't take instruction from somebody of a low birth. <laughs> somebody should, they should, be, should have been a brahmana. You usually have a council of brahmanas there to guide in the palace. They would think there would be brahmanas around. And Vidura is coming, giving instruction, telling him. Maharaj, if I may ask something inside. Something that so Vidura is also from the like you mentioned in the semen of Yasadev. So it, it becomes like he was uh, means of course I, I do not know how we reach out to that because she is uh, from the so do we take the cast of the mother or do we consider that from the father? And uh, nevertheless also he was a Vaishnav, so a Vaishnav is also bigger than a Brahmana kind of thing. Can we think of that? Uh, yeah, well, certainly it's true. Yeah, he's like the brother. In one way, they're like brothers because they're both from the semen of Vyasadeva. So there is some brother, brotherly relationship. But still, it, it came up that Duryodhana pointed, told him, you know, what 
you're uh, you're born you know you're it, there you don't criticize this birth right telling him that what kind of who are you to come and tell us what to do and, uh, how did it, how did he describe me Son of a kept mistress, Maharaj. Yeah, son, son of a kept mistress, right, right. He was just son of a Dasi Putra, right? She was one of the ladies there in the palace, one of the servants. Of, so that, that was certainly a, a, an insult to him. It wasn't a nice thing to say. But at the same time also, we have to remember who is Vidura, that pre, he's actually Yamaraj, right? that Yamaraj has come as Vidura, and certainly to take birth into the family of the Kauravas, to be, even though he's a Dasi, son of a Dasi Putra, but still to be born there into that family situation, it indicates some, you know, some, something very special. And he's born of the semen of Vyasadev, although it's in the womb of the Dasi Putra, but and then also from his previous birth, who is he that he is actually Yamaraj? And Yamaraj is also Dharmaraj. He knows everything. So certainly he is well qualified to give instruction. And as you said, he is like a Brahmana. Although maybe not by birth, not by birth, but in terms of quality, he is like the Brahmana. So we cannot overlook the judgment of Vidura. But to Duryodhan and to Dhritarashtra, they cannot appreciate the words. They cannot understand. They cannot accept what he has to say. Right? So, the chapter goes on, we will hear how Vidura takes the advantage to, to go and visit the holy places. And there are many holy places. Prabhupada says all over the planet there are many holy places. And go to see the beautiful forms of the Lord in the different temples. And most important, to go to hear from the devotees, the very special people who live in the holy places, which is the real purpose in going to the holy place. We don't just go to the holy place to take a bath, although certainly it's very good also to take a bath, but the real purpose is to bathe in the nectar coming from the mouth of the, the saintly devotees. We want to hear that. To, to take advantage of that nectar. All right. So, any are there any questions here today? Your voice is not clear, Prabhu. I'm sorry, I was breaking a lot. You were asking about Prabhupada taking questions, and after some time he didn't take questions. And what is it you want to know? So, uh, Maharaj, I wanted to know that you said that Srila Prabhupada used to take questions in the beginning of the moment, but later on he found that questions are challenging. That's why Srila Prabhupada used to tell that you can ask my disciples. 
So I wanted to ask Maharaj, first thing is, uh, was Srila Prabhupada finding the challenging questions or low quality questions from the devotees or even for, from, for the newcomers, Srila Prabhupada would avoid answering. And second thing is, we hear many times Srila Prabhupada and many senior devotees saying that in our movement, the specialty is we answer the questions in the end of the class. No other movement do that generally or the spiritual tradition. But uh, so I was a little bit confused that uh, uh, then Srila Prabhupada is not answering in the end of the that I wanted to understand, Mashallah Maharaj. Well, we have to understand in a public in a public forum that to hear challenging questions, it's not always a very pleasant thing. And it simply creates a lot of doubts in the mind of people. You know, for example, some Christian will come. Some Christian will come to the program and then they will stand up and say, why you chant the name of this person? You should chant the, the name of Lord Jesus Christ. And they will say, Jesus died for your sins. You should surrender. Like they will talk about Jesus. They don't come to hear and they don't come to inquire on the subject matter which is being spoken, but they come to preach their own sermon. They come to preach their own philosophy. So that's that kind of challenging situation. It's not very pleasant. If people come to the class, they come and sit in the light chair and listen to Prabhupada give a talk. And then some Christian stands up and starts saying something, you know, it's, it's, it, Prabhupada didn't like that very much. I was there one time in London, one Christian stood up and started talking, sh shouting at Prabhupada like that. So Prabhupada turned to his sannyasi disciple and he told his sannyasi disciple, you, you answer his question. And so the sannyasi stood up and answered the question. And so the point is, people ask questions, the, the questions should be relevant. They should be relevant and they should be of interest to the audience. But if it's just some challenging, just something like that, you know, some other philosophy, they come to present their own philosophy, they come to speak, they don't come to hear. And so Prabhupada didn't want to waste, he didn't want to give opportunity to these people. And it's also not very good for them to criticize Prabhupada and to attack Prabhupada, it's not good for them. Just like one time Prabhupada, the devotees went, went to a program and Prabhupada told the devotee with him, he said, ask the man to buy a set of books, to, he should buy a set of our books. So the devotee asked, he stood up and he spoke about the books and he asked the man to purchase the set of books. And the man said, no, no, I already have so many books. He didn't want to get the books. So then the devotee asked Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, did I say something wrong? Was it not good? And Prabhupada said, no, he said, you spoke very nice. He said, it was okay. And so the devotee said, said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, you should have asked him to buy the books. But Prabhupada said, well, if I had have asked him to buy the books and he didn't buy them, then it would not be very good for him. It would have been harmful for him because if he refused me. And so that's another point, you know, that if, if they stand up and criticize something, say something bad about Srila Prabhupada, it's very bad for them. So Prabhupada came to do good for people, to do good. Just like Lord Chaitanya, he had to take sannyas because his students were going to attack him, they were going to beat him. Lord Chaitanya came to deliver them and they were going to come and beat him. So he understood, I, I had to take sannyas. Then they will offer proper respect. So Prabhupada was cautious about how to benefit people. He wanted to give them mercy, not to deprive them of mercy. And if they stood up and just criticized Prabhupada and said something bad, you know, they'd ask Prabhupada, why you're sitting on a big seat? They would say things like that. Why you're sitting on a big seat? We're all sitting on the floor. And Prabhupada would say, are you, are you envious? 
And some other times then they're like, why you have to have a ring on your finger? Why you wear a ring on your finger? These kind of stupid questions, you see, the challenging questions, questions which are not very nice, which don't make a nice atmosphere. And so that's one reason why Prabhupada stopped taking questions. Public and public audiences. You understand, Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Maharaj, we have a question on the chat. I think uh, Vijay Prabhu's mic is not good. Can I just read it for you? Please. Uh, can every act of material energy acting in the life of the person be considered as the act of the yoga maya at every instance? Since since it is the way of perceiving the energy from the level of consciousness in our life. Hare Krishna Maharaj, your servant Vijay. Yes, uh, generally we consider all the actions to be yoga maya, the acts of the energy, material energy, is yoga maya. Yoga maya can act in two ways. We give the example, just like electricity. Electricity can be used to heat, and electricity can be used to cool. So, the same way maya. Maya can act to cover up Krishna, and maya can also act to reveal Krishna. There's the yoga maya and there's the maha maya. It's, it's actually all yoga maya. But yoga maya, can, you can also consider it one, the effect of the yoga maya to be like maha maya. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Naham Prakrisha Sarvatma Yoga Maya Samavrita. He says, I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency, Yoga Maya. So that Yoga Maya, Krishna said, I'm not manifest, I'm never manifest. He said, that's Yoga Maya. But that same Yoga Maya manifests Krishna. So the yoga maya can act in both ways. It can cover up Krishna, it can reveal Krishna. But we may, we may refer to the particular effect, oh this is maha maya, forgetfulness of Krishna, cover, for going away from Krishna, or seeing Krishna as an ordinary person. That, that we, we would think of that as maha maya. Maha maya is just a part of yoga maya. It's the effect of the yoga maya. So we see the material energy, it's all Krishna's energy, right? It's all Krishna's. The material energy is working under the direction of, we say, Mother Durga. But Mother Durga, she moves like a shadow under the control of the Supreme Lord. So ultimately it's all Krishna's arrangement. And the devotee sees Krishna's arrangement, that, oh, this is Krishna's mercy. One devotee was distributing books in the airport. You know, nowadays we don't distribute books in the airport. It's very difficult now. Airports are so tense, there's so, so much security, you cannot get near them. But in the past, one devotee was distributing books there. And so he offered a book to one man, and the man, his response was he just turned and punched him in the face. So what did the devotee do? You know, he could have fought with the man, he was not a weak devotee, he was not a puny devotee, he was a powerfully built devotee. When the man hit him in the face, what did the devotee do? He said, thank you, Krishna. He saw it as, thank you, Krishna. He saw this as Krishna's mercy, that Krishna's, Krishna's teaching me to be tolerant. Krishna's teaching me to be humble. So... This is an example of seeing Krishna, seeing the hand of Krishna in everything. You can see, you know, 
approaching people to distribute books. It, some people get very angry, very nasty. We just have to tolerate. We don't. We shouldn't get upset. No point in us getting angry. No point in us fighting with them. We just accept. Okay. They're, they're, they don't want Krishna consciousness. Look for somebody else. There are so many other people who are waiting for Krishna consciousness and who do want Krishna. So we have to see reversals, reversals which come. We have to see that this somehow this is Krishna's arrangement. And we may not appreciate that immediately, but after some time then you start to understand that this was really Krishna's arrangement. The difficulties, the troubles which I went through, it was really Krishna's arrangement to help me to have a better life with Krishna, to come closer, to be more connected to Krishna. And that's what happened to Vidura. Kicked out of the palace. He has, well, rejected, you know, pretty much he's told to get out. They hadn't physically thrown him out, he'd left on his own. If he'd not left, then they were going to throw him out, they were going to cane him. But he got out first. He didn't wait for that to happen, he got out. And that was to his advantage. It was a great blessing for him because I was telling him, he's Yamaraj. And as Yamaraj, he's always dealing with all the sinful people, punishing all the people. And there he was in the palace. And who was he in the palace with? He was with, in the palace with Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan and so many other sinners, Sakuni and Dushasan and all these people. So he got away from their bad association. He got away from all that bad association and he was able to go and visit the holy places. Just like Krishna does Kaviraj, he describes how he came to leave home. Mini Ketana Ramdas came to the home of Krishna does Kaviraj and he got insulted by the brother of Krishna Das Kaviraj. Krishna Das Kaviraj was, he was a devotee of Lord Chaitanya, but he did not have faith in Lord Nityananda. And Mini Ketana Ramdas was a great devotee of Lord Nityananda. So there was some tension there, there was some bad dealings and it ended up Mini Ketana Ramdas broke his flute and he left and disappointed. He said, this is like the second Romaharshan. He described the brother of Krishna Das Kaviraj as the second Romaharshan and he left their home. So that night Lord Nityananda appeared in the dream to Krishna Das Kaviraj and he told him, go to Vrindavan, get out from this home, go to Vrindavan, there you will attain everything. And Krishna Das Kaviraj is written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita like that, he said, he didn't even wait for the morning. In the middle of the night, he woke up, he got up from bed and he immediately left home and he went to Vrindavan and he got the shelter of Rupa and Sanatan and Raghunath and it was there, he heard all the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he could write Chaitanya Charitamrita. Such wonderful nectar. He had to leave home, he had to get out from his home, leave his brother and everyone. But why should he stay with these nasty, offensive people? Get out from the home and go and be with the devotees and cultivate Krishna consciousness. So that's the message. All right, any, any comments or questions? Okay, so then I'll meet you on Friday. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Jai.
गोड़ भक्त वृंद की हरे कृष्णा